thanks for being here. I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person. Uh, my name is Milan Shani, and I'm an applied scientist at Amazon. And I've been working on machine learning for the last one and a half years at Amazon. And uh, today I'll be talking about transformers, and in particular, how you could make them better with the techniques of synthetic query generation and lexical search to get state-of-the-art results for search. So let's begin. Enterprise search is a hard problem. Now, this is something that I'm sure needs no selling to this audience. But nevertheless, just to be concrete, the reason why it is hard is because it has very strict requirements. Strict requirements of runtime latency, index sizing, costs, search relevancy, and of course, generalization capabilities. What I mean by generalization capabilities is the solution that we have for this hard problem needs to do well, not only on the domain for which it was built for, but on all kinds of different data domains. In other words, the solution that we want needs to be quick, accurate, inexpensive, and robust. And anyone who has worked on this problem, which is basically all of you, knows that all of these requirements are intertwined with each other. There are solutions which are quick and accurate, but aren't robust. There are some solutions that are inexpensive and robust, but not so quick, and so, and so on. So is it even possible to make progress on this problem? Well, I believe that the answer is yes. And that is because we live in this era of internet-sized data sets and significant compute abilities. And of course, we live in the era of pre trained transformers, which is LLMs. And I do believe that we are at this pivotal moment where we can make progress. And you know, progress we shall make. After all, that's what this conference is about. And I'm very excited to present the solution that I think is a step forward in solving this problem. And so this brings me to the outline of the talk. I split the talk into five different parts. The first part would be a precise formulation of what the problem is. The second part would be what I think is a solution for this problem, which is fine-tuned models, small fine-tuned models combined with BM25. And when we present the solution, we'll realize that building the solution would require two key ingredients. The first ingredient would be synthetic query generation. This is the technique that will allow us to build fine-tuned models. Once we get a fine-tuned model, we still have an open question, which is how do we combine them with lexical search? How do we combine them with BM25? And that's what the list of combination methods has to do with. And this will naturally lead us to the fourth part of the talk, which would be about experiments and results. In this section, we talk about the different combination methods that we try to combine these two powerful retrievers to get state-of-the-art results, and the different test data sets that we use on which we evaluate these results. And finally, I'll conclude with future directions. So let's begin. Perfect. So keyword search has been the state of the art for, our, for solving research problems for decades now. It is quick, it is robust, and it is inexpensive. Well, if that is the case, then what gives? Well, unfortunately, as most of us know, it does not understand semantics. So let me give an example that I often like to bring up. I'm searching over here, or a corpus of 30,000 images. Each image comes with a caption. So I'm searching over captions. It's a text search. It has nothing to do with images. The images just tag along. But the captions are quite relevant to the images. So it's nice to have the images to you know, parse the results faster. On the left-hand side, the results will be from BM25. On the right-hand side, we'll get results from transformers. So when I ask for a query such as Wild West, this is what we find. On the left-hand side, we get results based on West Virginia University, or a wild animal, or the dog breed West Highland Terrier. But on the right hand side, we get results about cowboys and rodeos, which indeed are related to the Wild West and the American frontier. So clearly the transformers on the right hand side seem to be understanding what the user wanted it to understand. And using transformers for search seems like a very promising direction. And that's because Transformer understands semantics. This is what BM25 lacks. BM25 does not understand semantics. And so it is appealing to use Transformers for search. And in fact, the first pivotal moment for in this direction came when Transformers were used for search in this 2019 paper on a particular data set. And it was shown that when Transformers were built and trained for search, they led to a substantial improvement over BM25. And ever since then, there has been a flurry of work. There are different architectures that have come up and different models that have been released. And overall, the community has narrowed down into these two different main paradigms. 
And those paradigms have been the cross encoder paradigm and the dense encoder paradigm. The cross encoders are powerful but slow, while dense encoders are fast but not as powerful. We'll not go into the details of the architecture for the moment because that'd be too much. We'll do that as 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 the need be. But it's good to have a mental model for how the transformer works. So a transformer, for us in the context of search, a query comes in, the transformer reads the query, but at the same time, the transformer has also access to all the passages and the documents present in your corpus. This access to all the documents of your corpus could be via vector DB, it could be via a first stage retrieval system, whatever. It does not matter for our mental model. All that happens is that a query comes in, a transformer has access to all the corpus, and the output would be a list of ranked results. And that's the mental model like to have. And based on your requirements, then you can decide whether you want to have cross encoders or whether you want to have dense encoders for your search purposes. But once you've figured out what architecture to use, you are still left with this question, which is what model should I use? Because there are hundreds of cross encoder models out there and hundreds of dense encoder models out there. So how do we decide what to use for our, for our search needs? And so a good heuristic to have, which at this point has almost become a fact, is that scale helps. Large models trained on large data sets lead to better results. They can also generalize pretty well on different domains. And there are several publicly available models, all the way from 10 million parameters to 10 billion parameters and even more. And so one idea would be that should we just pick the largest model and call it a day? Well, that would have been a good strategy, but unfortunately, large models are also quite expensive. And that's because the amount of compute that these models require, it increases with the size of the model, the cost, and therefore also increases with the compute and the size of the model. And therefore, out of the box, billion parameter models, models that require multi-GPU instances or models that require multiple nodes of multi-GPU instances is not the answer for many users. We want an answer which is cost effective, at the same time relevant. And this is what brings us to small transformers. Small transformers, several of them exist public, on publicly available data sets, and these small models are quick and inexpensive. But the small models come with their own bag of problems. The problems that smaller models come with is that they fail to generalize. And this is the famous work from a few years from last year by Thakur et al., the beer challenge and the beer data set, where they showed that if you take a small transformer model and use it on out of domain data, that is data it was not trained on, then the performance degradation of these transformers was pretty significant. In particular, the transformers performed even worse than BM25. And so we spent all of this time in this compute to build the transformers, but they only worked in order to fail. So how do we fix this problem? And that's where comes the precise problem statement, which is how do we untap the potential of transformers, which clearly seem to be capturing some aspect of search relevance and natural language understanding, while promising the requirements of enterprise search, such as low latency, low cost, high search relevancy, and robustness. We believe that the solution to this problem is small fine-tuned models combined with BM25. And this is what we turn to next the solution of fine-tuned models with BM25. And so first I'll have to define what fine-tuned models are. So for that, we need to understand pre-trained transformers. Pre-trained transformers are the most native, the most primitive models that you can obtain. And these models are trained on swaths and like terabytes of data on data sets such as all of Wikipedia, Wikibooks, and so on. These transformers are trained for a single task, which is to predict the next token in the sentence. And so this is different from fine tuning. Fine tuning is what happens after the pre-trained transformer has been done, has finished pre-training. For fine tuning, what is typically done is you take the model and you train it on more data on the task of your choice. So the task is no longer next token prediction, but the task is whichever task you want to use it for. For us, that is going to be search. So let's be more concrete. In order to obtain fine tuned transformers, we need a few things. The most important thing is training data. We also want this training data to be similar to the test domain, which is we want to train the model on data, which is going to be similar to what will be tested upon. If we train it on data that is not similar to what will be tested upon, that's not the best use of resources. This training data 
should be in the form of labeled data. So for search, that labeled data means we need queries and we need passages and we need labels between them, which is whether these query passages are relevant or whether they're irrelevant, if they're relevant, how relevant they are. Once we have a fine-tuned model that is trained on this data, it is almost a fact that this fine-tuned transformer will boost in performance. This is something that we found across several data sets, across several tasks, and it's almost a fact that fine-tuning will lead into better performance. And so that's what we want to do. We want to fine-tune our transformers, small transformers, on labeled data. So to be precise, the kind of labeled data we are looking for is queries and passages and a relevance label. So for example, if this is the query and the passage is what you see, then a nice uh, correct label for it would be a plus, which is that they are relevant with each other. So this is the kind of data that we want. Except the issue is that most users do not have such label data. We have access to passages, but we do not have access to queries. Some users do have queries, but even those, they don't have the relevancy pairings, which is queries and passages, and then the relevancy rating between those queries and passages. One strategy could be that we just go out and try to collect such data using manual effort. We can, given passages, create queries, or given queries and passages, try to match them. But this requires a lot of manual effort, is expensive, and is also quite hard to scale. And so this seems kind of tragic that we spent, we led up to this architecture of small fine-tuned models. It seems to be quite promising only to realize that we don't have the key ingredients to obtain a fine-tuned model. But this is where the era of large transformers and large data sets and giant compute abilities come in. This is where large transformers come to the rescue. Instead of having a human-generated queries, we can have a large model which reads passages and creates queries. And that is because, and that is because large transformers we know have a great, a greater understanding in generating natural language text. So let me give a concrete example. So say, um, say you're reading a passage. Say the passage is on Gertrude Elian, the famous American biochemist and Nobel Prize winner, uh, known for uh, methods it for drug discovery. Ideally, if a model reads this passage, it should create queries such as. You know, who was Gertrude Elian, how did her work change drug discovery, or how did her work benefit humanity, and so on. These queries are precisely answered by the passage. So these are good queries for this passage. Also, these are the kind of pass these are the kind of queries that a human might actually ask. So having a passage and then a model read the passage and create such queries will be the will be a great step in collecting labeled data. And this is the technique of synthetic query generation which is you come in with a document corpus, you let the synthetic query generator, which is a large language model basically, read those documents and create synthetic query comma passage pairs. Once you have those synthetic queries and passages, now you can bring your favorite pre-trained transformer, fine tune it on this label data and obtain a fine tuned transformer. And this fine tuned transformer will necessarily be very good uh, at downstream task for search. However, there is a small caveat, which is that this fine-tuned transformer is trained on synthetic data and not real data. But we have found that even fine-tuned models trained on synthetic data close the performance gap between small and large models. And it's not just us, this is something that we as community have found that using synthetic data, which is then used for training fine-tuned models, which is used for training models to obtain fine-tuned models, lead it to very good performance and our work is a part of that line of work. But there is a final piece of puzzle before we end the loop. It's not the case that we can use a fine-tuned model and call it a day. And that is because all transform models have inherent issues due to its finite size vocabulary. So let me give you a concrete example. Say you have a query that comes in for a factory part number. The query is F7GN. The way a transformer reads this word is that it reads words by breaking into parts such that it recognizes the individual parts. So if a transformer reads a word that is part of its vocabulary, it's all good. But if it reads a word that is not part of its vocabulary, it breaks it down into smaller parts until it recognizes each and every part. Now for F7GN, the only way you can break it down is down to the alphabet. 
because F7 or GN or 7G don't make any sense. So the transformer breaks into four different tokens. It understands each token and then adds them up to get the representation for a factory part number, which is this F7GN. But this clearly would be the wrong thing to do because the factory part number is like an atomic unit. You cannot break it down any further. Conversely, if you do break it down any further, just combining the individual alphabets clearly does not convey the meaning as the entire sequence of F7GN. Clearly, the sum is greater than its parts. And this is something even the largest transform models have an issue. Even GPTN will have an issue as long as this vocabulary is finite. And of course, the vocabulary is going to be finite since you can't have infinite size things. And so what do we do next? But this is precisely where our old friend BM25 returns. Because this is precisely where lexical search excels. Syntactic matches that match exactly is the forte of BM25. And so it is natural that we combine these two retrievers. We combine the transformers and we come with BM25. They have complementary strengths and combining them, there is good intuition for us to believe that it will lead to good results. But of course, as soon as we decide that we need to combine them, we'll have to figure out how do we combine them. And the answer to that question is not easy. And that is because the results that we get from BM25 for a particular query and the results that we get for, from a transformer for a particular query, those results both capture very different notions of similarity. One is about semantic matching, while the other is about syntactic matching. Even when you keep that aside, both of these retriever models use different scoring methods. So they belong to different scales. So we don't even know how to combine those scales or how to put them in the same footing. And there is no principled way which could teach us how to combine these two methods. And this is a, and this is a complex problem. And I, I, I guess giving some examples will bring some intuition of why this is a hard problem. So these are real examples with real queries on a real, pass, on a real data set that I used. So for a query such as starting at Web and Van Gogh, you get these results. On the left is transformers, on the right is BM25. All of these results seem to be relevant to some degree. But say if we combine these results, we combine transformers and BM25, and then we just you know, sort them by the scores. Clearly, that would not be the right thing to do since BM25, even though it has relevant results, would never make it to the top 10 since BM25 has a scores in the 30s, but transformer has a score in the high 90s. So one thing that we learned right away is that if you want to combine these two methods, we'll need to normalize them. We'll need to make sure that all the results returned by transformers have scores between zero and one. Similarly, all the returns, all the scores returned by BM25 should also be between zero and one, and then we combine them. But even after normalization, the problem is not solved, it's far from being solved. So let me give you another example of why that's the case. Say you're looking for a query, say Thoreau, uh, the famous philosopher. On the right hand side, BM25 gives you results which are spot on. But on the left hand side, you get results which have nothing to do with the philosopher. Well, it's because you see when a transformer reads the word Thoreau, Thoreau is a popular word, but nevertheless, it's not the 50,000 most popular words, so it's not in the vocabulary. It breaks the word Thoreau into Thor and O, and guess which other word has Thor as its root? It's thorax. And so on the left-hand side is about human thoraxes. So in this, in this paradigm, even if we normalize the scores between zero and one, and if we combine them, that wouldn't be the right thing to do, since the ideal thing over here would be to just ignore the transformer, since the results make no sense at all. So the point I'm trying to convey is that there is no unique method that we can try, such that it will work well for every single data set. And so what is the approach that we take? Well, the approach that we take is let users be the final arbitrator of what good results are. So combine the methods, combine transformers and BM25 in a variety of ways, and then just evaluate them on different test data sets. These test data sets come with ground truth user annotations and just evaluate them on these different test data sets and pick the one that performs the best on average. And that's the strategy that we take. And those, and, and that's how we evaluate which method to basically use. So this then completes the puzzle and we go to the ingredients, which is the synthetic query generation technique, which is used for fine tuning and the combination techniques, which is used for combining them. So let me recap the image of synthetic query generation that we saw before. 
A set of documents come in, the query generator creates synthetic queries on which you train a model. There are two questions that we need to answer here. The first question is, what kind of synthetic query generator to use? And the second question is, what kind of pre-trained transformer do we use, which will be later tuned on the synthetic corpus? So let's begin with the first question, which is what model should be used for synthetic query generation? So there are a few options over here. The first option is to use a large model as an API. Now this is, this is a paradigm that has become really popular in the last few months, especially since November of last year. And there are APIs of ever increasing model sizes. And we can use an API to create queries for our passage. I feel there are two small issues when it comes to such large model APIs though. The first is cost and the second is privacy. Large model inference is expensive and so your builds can uh, rake up pretty quickly. So that's one problem. But at the same time, there is an issue of privacy. Say you are building a search engine for internal search documents. Most probably you don't want to send those internal search documents to an external API to read and to train upon. So there are two issues of cost and privacy. Although I must add, the large model inference is getting cheaper. We were working on this problem for enterprise search last year. In last June versus this June, the price of large model inference has been reduced by as much as 30 times. So large model inference pricing is getting competitive, but unfortunately that has also come with a new, newer, newer restrictions and newer terms of services where if you use the output of a large radio model to train your own model, you have to make sure that that model does not compete with any of the other models that the uh, API company is providing. So using large model as an API is a valid direction, but, I'm not, but probably not for most, not for all users. And so this brings us to what we do, which is we use an in-house model. We use a relatively small model, GPT-2, with 1.5 billion parameters. Now it is small by today's standards, but one year ago it wasn't it, it was it wasn't uh, that small. So we use this relatively we use this 1.5 billion parameter model to generate queries. But if you just use the 1.5 B model to generate queries, it's not good enough. So what we have to do is we need to take this GPT model and we need to train it to ask queries. This is, of course, a task of fine tuning again. So we fine tune the GPT model for the task of query generation. This requires time and this requires effort, but it's all done and it's been released. And we released a 1.5 billion model, parameter model last November. It's free for anyone to download and to use. And anyone can use it to create their own synthetic corpora in-house. And <clears throat> all of this can be achieved using open source tools in open search. And of course, it also requires a little bit of hardware because we need GPUs in order to run this model. So that is, but we'll be going through the amount of exact cost that is involved in doing this. Okay, so that's the first part about how we use the SQG model to create synthetic queries. Now, before we actually go and look at the kind of queries that this synthetic query generator model creates, let me just briefly mention how this model was fine-tuned. So the model is the 1.5B model. It is fine-tuned for the task of query generation on 650,000 pairs of labeled query and passages from these two very popular data sets, MS Marco and Natural Questions. To be precise, we take the 1.5B model, we give it a passage. So let's say we give it a passage on the Watts riots, which was a rebellion that happened in LA some time ago. And the model is asked to, is trained to ask the following question, which is, when did the Watts riots start and end? And similarly, for 650,000 other queries and passages. And this is how the model is tuned. So we take the pre-trained model, we tune it on these 650,000 queries and passage pairs, and this is how it learns to ask good questions. Okay, so once it does learn how to ask good questions, let's see how does it, what are the actual questions that is it asked? So we take the synthetic query generator model, we feed in some passages when he, and we ask to, to generate queries. Now these 10 queries, sorry, these, these nine queries have been randomly sampled there is one missing, uh, it's a random sample of 10. I had to remove one passage because it had an inappropriate term, but the remaining nine, there is a random sample. The query generator has never seen these passages before. It is creating these queries by looking at these passages for the first time. Although the passages were never seen by the model, I must add that the 
passages belong to a data distribution which is very similar to Wikipedia and MS Marco and so on. And therefore, it's still not the best uh, way to test how good the model is. But nevertheless, we find that in domain, synthetic queries are pretty good. So you can like take a random one, like the last one is about flu and flu symptoms. And the question is how long does exposure to a flu affect symptoms? Just above it is the difference between retail and wholesale, which is what the passage is talking about. Above that is what's the best coming of speech ever, and so on. So it seems that the model is doing a good job. However, this is not the best way of measuring it, as I just mentioned, because we will be using this query generator model in the wild on domains that the model has never seen before. So how does the query generator model create, how are the quality of the qu queries on domains that has never seen before? So let's look at some concrete examples. These are real examples with the 1.5B model. The first passage is from Stack Exchange, I think. It's about how I'm a reporter marketplace. I'm looking to talk with programmers about the corporate culture in the tech world. And the query generates is what is the corporate culture at marketplace? Which is not completely which is not relevant because the question should have been what is the corporate culture at tech companies? The second query is about how Americans consume too many hamburgers, and the purpose of the study is to assess the content of eight fast food hamburger brands. The query generator asks the question, what protein was detected in hamburger? Which is kind of relevant, but it's like losing the forest for the trees because it should have asked what are the contents found in hamburger chains, for instance. And the last passage is about uh, a scientific abstract about human monocytes and the query that it generates is what causes peripheral vascular resistance. This is a completely hallucinated query. And as far as I could tell, I couldn't understand what the query was asking, which was relevant for that passage. So what we see is that the query generator model creates queries, but the query degrades on out of domain data. But what we find and our design choices were such, such that this does not matter so much. Query quality of course is important, but it has diminishing returns. And the reason why it has diminishing returns has to do with how we train the model. And so this is where we need to go to the next part, which is we have the synthetic corpus with us. We use the synthetic corpus to train our pre-trained transformer to get a fine-tuned transformer. So now we need to come back to the second decision we had to make, which is what is the pre-trained transformer that we are going to use for fine-tuning on the synthetic corpus. So first, to begin with, we'll have to decide whether we want to use a cross encoder or a dense encoder. We choose dense encoders. And that is because dense encoders are very quick, although they are less effective than cross encoders. Now, I had to use air quotes, unfortunately, and that's because I feel that saying it's less effective is kind of unfair. Cross encoders work in what is known as a re-ranker paradigm, which is for a given query, the cross encoder first asks BM25 or a very fast retrieval system to get the top 100 results. And then the cross encoder reads the query and those 100 results and then re-ranks those 100 results. Well, for a dense encoder, you give it a query and it just gets the top results. And so a dense encoder does not require BM25, while a cross encoder does. So to compare dense encoders and cross encoders, I feel is not the most fair comparison. And instead of the way I like to think about them is that we should think of dense encoders and BM25 as a very powerful first stage retrieval system. And this retrieval system can then be used for whatever downstream purpose that you are interested in. It could be used for re-ranking by a cross encoder. It could be used for retrieval augmented generation for your generative AI models and etc. And so that's why we choose dense encoders. Now, let me quickly uh, brush the memory for some folks for which dense encoders might have been forgotten. So recall that for dense encoders, everything is a vector. Any query comes in, any passage comes in, it vectorizes it. So to begin with, all the passages come in. The dense encoder forms a vector out of those passages. These are all the red vectors in the diagram above. Then a query comes in, say a query for dog breeds comes in. The dense encoder creates a takes in the query dog breeds and converts a vector out of it. And that's the blue vector that you see. And finally, you run a nearest neighbors algorithm. So for that blue vector, you look at all the vectors that are close to that blue vector and you retrieve that. So for this, it worked out. It would be poodle and golden retrievers and huskies. So that's how dense encoders work. So recall, we have a synthetic corpus. We have decided what is the architecture for our pre-trained transformer. It's going to be a dense encoder. So now all that remains is for us to figure out how do we precisely train this dense encoder on the synthetic corpus. So the way we train it 
is what is known as contrastive loss. We take a very popular state-of-the-art dense model called a TASB and we fine-tune it on the synthetic corpus using contrastive loss. So I don't want to go into a lot of detail, but just heuristically, the way I like to think of contrastive loss is the following. The TASB model reads the passages. It converts the passage into a vector. For every passage vector that it reads, it also reads a lot of synthetic queries. If the synthetic query is generated for that particular vector, which means it's a relevant uh, query, TASB is asked to convert that query into a vector such that the passage vector and the query vector are close to each other. At the same time, you also feed in query vector, you also feed in queries that are not relevant to that passage. So you know you just randomly select any query from the rest of your synthetic queries. And, you, and the model is asked to map this query vector far away from the original passage vector. And that's it. That's how contrastive loss works. And this is what leads to these models being fine-tuned and which lead to this phenomenal performance. However, I had promised one thing, which is the, about query quality, that I was going to explain why query quality does not matter. And so the way the query quality does not matter, in my opinion, the way I think about it intuitively, is that you can trade the quality of the synthetic queries for their quantity. So instead of generating, say, two synthetic queries for a passage, let's say we generate 20. So for every passage, we generate 20 synthetic queries. Each synthetic query is relevant to the passage, but it's also a bit irrelevant. And each query is irrelevant in its own ways. So intuitively, for a given passage, when you ask this contrast to loss to take place, you basically add up all the vectors for the queries. And all the irrelevantness of the different queries averages out. And what remains is the meat of those 20 queries, the shared concept of those 20 queries, which is a relevant message, which is present in the best vector. And this is why you can trade quality for quantity. And that's indeed what we find. We generate 20 different queries uh, for every given document. So if you say a corpus has 1,000 documents, you generate around 20,000 passage comma query pairs. And on this passage comma query pairs, you train a model. And that's how you obtain the fine-tuned model. Uh, of course, the question would be, what is the cost for all of this? But well, the cost for all of this, for the, there will be two parts, the query generation and the fine-tuning. The query generation for a 250,000 document would take around less than $500 and fine tuning the model on this 5 million corpus because 20 times 250,000 is 5 million would take another less than $100. So that's the rough cost for this entire procedure. And once we have trained this, now comes the final step of the puzzle, which is com combination with BM25. So the way we combine with BM25, there are infinitely many ways, so we have to select a few. And the way we select is in the following. The retrievers, the BM25 and the dense models, they come up with the results and with their own scores. We combine those scores using four different combinations that is easy that are in, easy to interpret. Arithmetic mean, harmonic mean, geometric mean, and a weighted linear combination. So let me show you some formulas, maybe provide more intuition. So to be precise, for every query, BM25 gets results, B1, B2, dot, 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 while fine tuned transformers also get results, N1, N2, dot, dot, dot. And you combine them using these different methods into a score SI. And this score SI is then finally sorted to get your rank results. The twiddles that you see on the Bs and the Ns correspond to the fact that the scores are normalized. And we normalize the scores between zero and one. We use both min max and L2, regular, L2 normalization to get this. And finally, in the last uh, beta linear combination, there is a factor F. This factor F ranges from 0.1 all the way to 16. So we try different values of F as well. And this finally gets us to the part that I think we all wanted to go, which is the results and experiments. Uh, before I tell the recap, which is you create a synthetic corpus, tune a model on it, and then use a model with BM25 to get the combined results. Okay, so what are the results? How well do these architectures work on uh, data that they've never seen before? So we take 10 test data sets, nine from the beer challenge and the Amazon hard shopping queries data set. On these 10 data sets, which the model has never seen, we get the following results. TASB performs minus 4% with BM25, while the fine-tuned combination of TASB with BM25, to be precise, the geometric combination gives a 14.3% lift on BM25. 
Note that the BM25 implementation that we're using is from OpenSearch, which performs slightly better than the BR BM25 implementation. So the BR BM25 implementation is often cited to for performance benchmarks. So in terms of them, we find that our model gets a 9.2 boost uh, in terms of the NDCG points for BM25. As from the best of my knowledge for dense models, this is, this is uh, a state of the art improvement, uh, especially given how quick these models, how quick and small these models are. And let me flash some results. I know it's very difficult to get through all of this, uh, but all of them can be found on the links that I'm gonna cite below. We also document the effects of normalization and how different normalizations can lead to different results. So what we found is whether you use min-max normalization or L2 normalization didn't really matter, but it did matter that you do use normalization. Without normalization, you do not get good results. And this finally leads to the last part, which is future directions. The first would be if you're interested to do this for your corpus, which I highly recommend would be to go on these links, download the Jupyter notebooks and just restart and run all. It will create synthetic queries for the documents that you give and also fine tune the models end to end. And even if you don't use the model end to end, just looking at those synthetic queries and then seeing how the model is generating queries, I think is a very useful exercise. So let me end finally some with open questions. The questions that we, I think as a community need to answer. The first is about scaling loss for information retrieval. Like can we figure out how performance changes with more data and more compute? The second is about can we train models on low resource human generated data using the recent techniques of RLHF, for instance. Finally, more, all of these dense models that we work with are very, very over parameterized like any other neural network. Can we turn that around such that we can decrease the index sizes of these models, such that we can use the dense models for keyword filtering? And this is an area of active research that we are pursuing and we really look forward to report. And finally, to end, all of us, I think we really need a small dense model which has longer context. Small dense models and small cross encoders such that they are in the 100 million parameter range but they can still read more than 512 tokens. And so with that, I would like to end my talk. Thank you very much for your attention and I look forward to um, listening to questions uh, uh, if there is time. Thank you, Milin, for the talk. We do have a couple minutes for questions. Yes. Hey, uh, thank you for the very good talk. Um, so we find that, uh, that MS Marco and natural questions are usually like, they're more from the domain of question answering and not so much retrieval. So the queries are usually quite long. Like they, they seem very natural language-ish. I would imagine that your pre-trained um, a query generation model uh, would also generate quite long queries. Um, how does your mo uh, model cope with like more usual, like the, the queries our, um, uh, our customers have are usually like one or two tokens. Um, how does your model uh, fare with that? Yeah, yeah, th that's a very good question. So uh, for natural questions in MS Marco, there are some questions, uh, like there, there is a distribution of queries at least for MS Marco. But nevertheless, I think the point stays that there is a mismatch in the distribution of like the lens. So what we do while doing model generation of, to of queries is that we set the temperatures and we set stop tokens and the sam we can sample in a way such that either you can have penalties for longer versus shorter queries, that's one. Secondly, we have found that even if the queries are short or say are long, especially when they're long, it does not really affect performance because in terms of that, think about how queries and documents work. Documents are always much, much longer than what queries are. But the way the transformer models average the vectors at the very end, you know, they take all the tokens and average it, even though queries and documents have very different vector, have a different lens, they still manage to get the right results. And the same holds true for queries of different lengths as well. And so we have found that even when we generate longer queries, in the end, the downstream performance of the models were only improved by that. Does that, does that answer the question? Oh yeah, that was very good, thank you.
Hi, I was wondering because when you talked about the synthetic query generation, you talked about generating positive pairs of um, query and passage, and I was wondering whether you also used negative pairs, so queries that do not answer a passage for training your model? You know, that is a great question. I wish we could do that. But MS Marco, unfortunately, comes with a lot of false negatives. So natural questions is a phenomenal data set. But with MS Marco, there are a lot of passages for which if you select, uh, for, there are a lot of queries for which if you select the passages which are not annotated to be plus one, you still, you, you still get false negatives because there are passages that were relevant but were marked as not relevant for that query. And so finding queries that are not, finding passages that are not relevant for the queries but are still kind of relevant is difficult from the data curation viewpoint. But if we did have that, that would be fantastic because then we could also create hard and negative queries, which can be very useful for the training of the downstream task B model. I presume that's why you were asking why, why, like the existence of negative queries, right? Yes. Thanks. Can I? Okay. okay. Uh, thanks for your talk. Uh, very insightful. Um, at the beginning, you presented the challenges of enterprise search. And uh, there is one challenge for me, which is document access security, which document I am entitled to uh, based on the roles in the organization. Um, how do you address uh, such challenges? Yeah, I think this question is in, this, in the paradigm of filtering, I would like to say. So for that matter, any problem which has these hard constraints can be thought of as a filtering problem. It's just that the filtering now, whether it's done on the passage side or whether it's done on the query side, there's a different ways of looking at it, but in the end it comes down to filtering. And so this is a very interesting problem. How do you do filtering with these dense models or with the transformers? That is an open question. Um, filtering is obviously trivial for BM25. But for transformers, it is very hard. Now, we are actually pursuing techniques right now which can help filtering with transformers. But I guess the short answer to the, your uh, question is that we don't have a solution. Thank you. All right, I think I have to cut you off for more questions. I'm sorry. Um, thank you very much again, Milind. Um, thank you for joining us. And yeah, I hope you all enjoyed it. Well, I wish I was there in person. Thank you.